بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ويلكم تو ايرا اي ام دكتور محمد طلعت اسيستنت بروفيسور في جورج كاي يونيفرستي توداي وي ويل ديسكاس تو كيسز تو امبورتنت كيسز ليتس ستارت باي ذا فيرست كيس يانج ادلت بيشنت ويز هيستوري اوف ار تي اي روت ترافيك اكسيدنت اند ليتس ستارت باي ذا بون ويندو وي هاف كومينيوتد ديبريست فراكشر انفولفينج ذا رايت تيمبرو برايت كالبيريال بون اند ذيس فراكشر As you can see, it is depressed fracture. And once we have any depressed fracture, you should comment on two points. First, is a depressed fracture greater than the calvarial bone? And is this depressed fracture? Let us take red color. Is a depressed fracture bypassing this normal non-depressed calvarial bone? Yes, for sure. This depressed fracture is by passing the whole thickness of the non-depressed calvarian bone. And second point, we should measure the depressed fragment from the inner table of the non-depressed bony segment from here to the inner table of the depressed bony segment. And this one measures about 4.5 millimeter. As we said in many videos before, that if we have any case, trauma case, we should check all the bone. We should check the petrous bone, the oscules, the otic capsule, the mastoid. We should check the zygoma, zygomatic arch, and atlantoaxial articulation. We should also check the orbits and baronese sinuses and the cranial cervical junction in the sagittal plane. The indication of surgery for depressed bone fracture include if the calvarial bone is depressed more than the whole thickness of the non-depressed calvarial bone. This is one of the potential indication for surgical interference. Also, in some institute, if the depressed bony segment is depressed more than 8 to 10 millimeters, in our case, is depressed for about 4.5 millimeter. Also, if we have any focal neurological deficit induced by the depressed bony segment, those are the main indications for surgical interference. In any trauma case, as we did before in many videos, we should start step by step in a systematic way from outside to inside. We have Subgallial extracranial hematoma at the right frontal temporal region. Also, we have small area, small high dense area with hyperdense fecal hemorrhage at the right frontal region, representing area of brain contusion. We have also similar areas of brain contusion at the right temporal region. Also, at the right parietal region, we have also similar areas of brain contusions. Try to find any extra exit collections. I think we have something like subdural collection here. But really, I, I'm not sure is it present or not. Let's check in different planes. Once we have a suspicious of any extra exit collections, we should measure any midline shift. Midline shift should be measured from the foramen of Monroe, as we did before in many cases. This is 2.4 millimeter midline shift. It is minimal and not significant. The indication for surgery, if it is exceeded more than 5 millimeter. We have here this pallet cerebrum. I think it is for a little bit thickened posteriorly, maybe subdural collection, I'm not sure. Once we have any trauma case, as we said, this is the direction of the trauma. So we should check if there is any contact co injury of the brain. We don't have any contact co injury. We don't have any cerebral contusions on the contralateral sides. 
we don't have any intraventricular hemorrhage, no subarachnoid hemorrhage. Posterior fossa structures are clear. So, in any trauma case, as we mentioned before, we should search for four main complications. First, brain edema. Second, brain herniation. Third, hydrocephalus. Fourth, encephalocele. So we have 2E and 2H. Encephalocele is considered as a rare late complication and most commonly occurs at the anterior cranial fossa and best demonstrated at the coronal and surgical humans. So let's focus. Is there is any evidence of brain edema? I think we have mild brain edema. If we check the cortical sulci on the right side, it is swollen. And if it's as compared to the contralateral side, so we have evidence of mild brain edema. We don't have any evidence of brain herniation. The basal cisterns are clear. We don't have any evidence of ankle herniation or even supper sign brain herniation. We don't have any evidence of hydrates. Let's move to the coronal pain. In the coronal pain, you can check all the abnormalities again. But I think it is now clear that we have a small subdural hematoma. This is the border of the subdural hematoma. You should measure the maximum thickness of the subdural hematoma. And this is one of our teaching points to pick up subtle abnormalities, as you can see here. This is a small subdural hematoma along the right temporal region. Also, I think this is now clear. We have very thin film of subdural hematoma. We don't have any other significant abnormalities. We did follow up for the case in the second day, and I think the brain contusions are more obvious. And I think the subdural hematoma is progressed in size. I think it is more obvious now. In the coronal plane, as you can see here, the subdural hematoma becomes larger in size. And also, if we trace the tenturium leaflets, the right side tenturium, the right side tenturial leaflet is expanded by the extension of the subdural hematoma. So we have, <clears throat> so we have for sure evidence of mild progression in size of the subdural hematoma. So my message here is don't ignore any subtle finding in the initial CT scan because sometimes it can be more serious in the follow-up. As you can see here, the subdural hematoma is, was very subtle in the initial CT scan, but in today's study, it is progressed in size and it can be more serious in follow-up CT scan of the brain. So our second case today, an adult patient that was presenting with acute loss of conscious living and as you can see here we have multiple hypodense patch areas involving many areas at the left cerebral hemisphere let's go in a systematic way we have the left lentiform nucleus the left insula the left temporal region, the left frontal parietal region. Those areas represent an acute infarction along the left middle cerebral artery territory. And this infarction is acute because we have effacement of the cortical sci. We have 
loss of the gray white matter interface. So for sure we have a form of cytotox cytotoxic brain edema and it's acute cytotoxic brain edema. Also we have another tree tree. Let us see the frontal loop. It is totally effaced and there is a large hypodense area at the left frontal loop. Also the frontal hypodense area is extending posteriorly along the left paramedian portion along the left front to right region, parafal sign and location. This is a territory of left anterior cerebral artery. So we have combined infarction along left anterior cerebral artery and middle cerebral artery. Let's go to the right side. We have also right side, right paramedian, hypodense area at the frontal region. We have also here at the high frontal region. We have hypodense area and the basement of skull that's side. We have also the codate nucleus is hypodense. The codate nucleus is supplied by the middle cerebral artery and its inferior aspect is also supplied by the anterior cerebral artery. So we have here, in conclusion, we have acute cerebral infarction along the left middle cerebral artery, left anterior cerebral artery, and to a less extent, right anterior cerebral artery. We have also a good point or a teaching point here. Both salamai are spurred, as we said, in one of our last videos, salami are supplied by the salam operating arteries, and these arteries are arising from the posterior cerebral artery. We don't have any abnormalities at the posterior posterior or brainstem. We don't have any hemorrhagic brain insert. Also, we don't have any dense MCA sign. We don't have any cold sign within the dural venous sinuses. I think it's a very interesting case and it shows an infarction along different territories. Front parietal region, you can see hyperdense, gyriform, hyperdense elements. And this may represent a form of starting cortical laminar necrosis. Please don't diagnose this one as hemorrhagic insert or hemorrhagic transformation of cerebral function. To complete our findings, we have an area of encephalomalacia at the left occipital region. We have also bilateral periventricular hypodense patch areas denoting chronic small vessel ischemic changes. This is our last teaching point here in this case. I hope you enjoyed our cases today and have a nice day. Thank you.